Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Thomas Stokely. I'm the OSU Extension Forester here in Central Oregon. It's my pleasure to be your host for today's uh, Oregon, or Oregon, <coughs> sorry, the, the Tree School Online webinar series, um, which is a production of the OSU College of Forestry, Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We wanna give recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for contributing to this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. Tree School online webinars are offered every first and third Tuesday of the month through June 2021. Also, we're offering a Eastern Oregon Forestry webinar series called Managing Eastern Oregon Forest offered every other Thursday evening at 6 o'clock p.m. starting on January 14th. Feel free to visit the Tree School Online webpage or the knowyourforest.org webpage for updates on these webinar series. I'd like to start with some initial housekeeping details uh, or rather Zoom room keeping details. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, Zoom toolbar. If you can't see it, go ahead and scroll your cursor down there at the bottom and you might notice that uh, that a bunch of different options show up. So we'll let you know that uh, audio is gonna be muted for all participants, video will not be available. Uh, please, if you have any questions, which I'm sure you will, write them in the Q&A box uh, located, like I said, down in the toolbar. Um, yeah, so make sure you enter those questions in the Q&A and not necessarily in the chat room. Chat should only be used if you're having problems and this will be monitored throughout by my colleague, Amanda Brenner. Um, resources, like I mentioned, you can look on our web pages um, for the Tree School Online class guide, which you can easily access through knowyourforest.org as well. Um, as Amanda has pointed out in the chat box, this webinar is being recorded and they'll be archived as YouTube videos and accessible from the Tree School Online pages. We'll introduce a couple polls, well, three polls throughout this webinar. The first poll will just be an introduction, uh, getting, letting us get to know you a little bit more. We'll have one in the middle of the webinar and then one at the end. And just as a disclaimer, uh, these views and opinions expressed by our speakers are theirs alone and not necessarily those of OSU, OFRI, or the Partnership for Forestry Education. I would like to introduce our speakers today. Fran Cafferatico and Julie Woodward. Fran Cafferatico is a consulting certified wildlife biologist. She works primarily with medium sized timber companies in, in, in Oregon. And Fran has helped develop wildlife programs for over a half million acres in Western Oregon and Washington. Julie Woodward is a senior manager of forestry education for the Oregon Forces, Forest Resources Institute, otherwise known as OFRI. She provides education programs for a variety of audiences, including family forest landowners, foresters, and the general public. She manages the Rediscovery Forest, an educational forest at the Oregon Garden in Silverton. And Julie holds a master's degree from the OSU uh, College of Forestry and Natural Resource Education and, and Extension, and a bachelor's degree in forest management. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce Fran real quick, and she can. Uh, Tell you what we're what we're going to talk about today. Awesome, thank you, Thomas. Thanks for that introduction, and uh, happy to be here today. It's nice to have everybody back from the new year. Today we are here to talk about forest as habitat for wildlife, priority actions for habitat management, and so our outline we've divided into two parts. And so part one will be um, I will present, and that's we're going to talk about priority actions for wildlife. We're going to do that by defining wildlife, defining different forest ages and how those relate to habitat and then talk about priority actions. And then there'll be time for question and answer. And then we'll come back from the question and answer and do part two and Julie Woodward is going to take over that then and really bring those, the, what we talked about into part one into management plans and how do you incorporate those priority actions into your management plan and plan for wildlife, talk about priority species, how do you set goals and then how do we take action? Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start a poll here just to get, uh, just to, let's see. 
so yeah, if you, you'll notice a poll just popped up and this poll is just to kind of introduce yourself and let us know where you're from, whether it's the Wyoming Valley, the coast, Southwest, Central, maybe you're outside of the state, uh, maybe you're outside of the US. And then the second question is uh, just a little bit more about yourself. Are you a woodland landowner? Are you a private natural resources professional? agency resource professional or a nonprofit natural resource professional. Maybe you're none of these. Maybe you just really enjoy learning more about wildlife and forestry. So that's that's awesome. We would love to have you. And um, the third is going to be how many acres of forest land do you own or do you manage? So that's for those of you that are either a natural resources professional or a landowner. So I'll give you uh, Give you just another like 30 seconds to try to fill this out real quick. There's one more question, Thomas. Oh, and do you, <laughs> sorry, the most important one, which is the one you see on the slide, do you mostly define wildlife as species that you commonly find, threatened and endangered species, species found on the Oregon Forest Practices Act, or species that you can hunt and eat? Great, so it looks like we've gotten quite a few of you, um, still a couple coming in, but I'm gonna go ahead and just, you know, for expedience sake, I'll go ahead and end this poll and share the results. So it looks like the majority of you are from the Willamette Valley, about 73% of you. Um, got a, you know, just two from coastal Oregon, a couple from Southwest, six from Central and Eastern Oregon, and about six from Washington. So that's great. It seems like the majority of um, folks here today are woodland landowners, um, as well as a mix of some agency, natural resource professionals, nonprofit, and other. And in terms of how many acres of forest land you own or manage, it seems like it's pretty well split from zero to over 1,000. So quite a wide variety of, of different parcels of land here. And seems like uh, most of you, 81% of you answered uh, at least to find wildlife as species that you commonly find with only a few um, reporting either threatened and endangered or Forest Practices Act. And a couple, just two says, say uh, species you can hunt and eat. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And Without further ado, um, it's time for Fran to go ahead and give you her, her talk. Awesome, thank you, Thomas. I'm so glad that we did that poll and asked you how you all define wildlife. Um, it's really different from how I think about it. So that's, um, that's great to see so many people thinking about the species that we commonly find. Um, let me just see if I can get this little video to work. There we go. Here's one of our common species in Oregon, crawling down the finger here. Um, and just to describe the rest of the photos in here, the osprey, which is um, you know, one that's in the Oregon Forest uh, Practices Act, little deer, for those of you that uh, hunt and eat, although we'd wait for it to get just a little bit bigger before we would hunt that one. And then the little frog species up here is another common one. So. Uh, um, We'll talk more about all of these species as we get into the presentation here. So um, Julie, who's my co-presenter today, is from the Oregon Forest Resources Institute. So she's gonna tell you a little about who, who Wolfrey is. Thanks, Fran. And thanks, Thomas. We're excited to uh, be here and part of this today. Um, OFRI, if you aren't familiar, is uh, created by the Oregon legislature in 1991. It's to help advance the public understanding of forest and forest management and to encourage sound forestry through landowner education through things like uh, the Tree School Online. Uh, we're a partner in this and so really trying to bring people together to help learn and educate. We're governed by a 13 member board and we're funded by a portion of the forest products harvest tax. And you can learn more about us at Know Your Forest or on OregonForest.org. And one of the programs that we um, have had for several years, but we find has been really important as we reach out to Oregonians is on our Wildlife and Managed Forest Program. And in our surveys and um, for both the Oregonians and for the landowners, we find 
that wildlife is always something of both concern and interest. Um, and so we've developed this program to help landowners and managers think about how to effectively and intentionally manage their forests for both wildlife and sustainable forestry. And so a big part of this program is we take the, all this great research that is being done around the state and help bring that and synthesize it uh, for people to think about how that may turn into actions on the ground for foresters, landowners, and managers. And, and so we do that through publications and outreach. And I get the uh, honor to work a lot with Fran as our contracted wildlife biologist. And so through this program, Fran and I've had a chance to develop different materials and outreach. And today we're excited to share more of that with you and give you some examples of things that we've done, but also um, get to know some of, uh, more about things that we've shared with landowners and excited to share with you today. So uh, Fran's gonna do this first part and I'll let her tell you more about um, Capra Consulting and take over for the first part. Awesome, thanks, Julie. Yeah, Thomas did a great job introducing me, uh, but I didn't give him a lot of information to go on. So for those of you who don't know me, um, Fran Cafferatico, and I'm the owner of Cafferatico Consulting, which is a small natural resource uh, consulting firm. I've got three biologists that work for me, and we do all kinds of things from species surveys, habitat assessments, um, and, and really our, our focus and what we're most passionate about is working with uh, a variety of clients, including OFRI, to manage intentionally for wildlife. And like Thomas said, um, we now have forest management plans that um, for wild, specifically developed for wildlife at about 650,000 acres in Western Oregon and um, Washington now for a variety of uh, timber company clients. And so we help them uh, implement those plans on the ground. So that's pretty exciting. That's a lot of ground that has a um, it's managed for forestry and also has an eye towards wildlife. So today, as we talked about, we were defining um, defining wildlife, and we the way I think about it when I'm starting a wildlife plan is I think about my my clients and I think about what we're trying to manage for, and we we lump it into different care uh, categories. Um, so we talk about animals that we can eat, like this. Uh, like the elk up here in the right hand corner. And this photo is provided by Thomas Stokely. And during his graduate work, he built the fence that you can see in the background here. We also sometimes have to think about animals that cause damage, which is also the elk that you can see here, or sometimes black bear can be a problem. Or sometimes we think about uh, animals with special status, like one big one that we sometimes think about is Northern Spotted Owl. I love sharing that video. You can hear the owl um, grab that mouse. So that was that video was taken by one of my biologists. Uh, I think it was I think it was this last uh, season. Um, and just a quick side note: if you're wondering what the heck we're doing out there, we're we're trying to figure out if the owl is nesting or not, and we do that by feeding it mice. And then we track the owl and watch what they do with the mouse. So if they eat like four mice in a row, we know they probably don't have a nest. But if they take the mouse to another owl or take it to a nest, then we can be pretty confident about what's going on. And that's important for management. And then obviously, like we learned in our poll, many of us are thinking about common species. And one of the common species here for those two people, I think it was, that are down in Southern Oregon is a Southern, Southern alligator lizard here, which is a really cool species. Um, commonly found in forests. So another way that we think about it when we're trying to decide, um, you know, how we're going to manage for wildlife is, is classifying the habitats that we have on our forests. And so we think about those, um, do you have young forest, which is generally open, um, like the picture here, happens after a disturbance event, and that can be wind event, um, fire like we've had this past summer. So we have a lot of new acres of young forest, um, or we will once we get it all replanted, um, or after a timber harvest. And there's lots and lots of wildlife that rely on young forests. We have, as part of our wildlife and managed forest program, we do have the songbirds in early seral forests publication um, that focused actually on a lot of the work that um, Thomas was involved in. Um, he was involved in the deer and elk portion of it, but we also looked at songbirds. And so like the Western bluebird and the orange crown warbler here are both found in young forests. There's a lot of other species that also rely on young forest conditions. 
And then middle-aged forest is that next, you know, once the canopy starts to close and they can, um, they get, you know, not as much light reaching the canopy. And um, it looks like the, the photo we have here. And species that we find in middle-aged forests, um, you know, the Stellar's jay, quite a few bat species, um, northern red-legged frog, although I point out with the northern red-legged frog is it would also, you know, needs to be near water, there needs to be downed wood. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for wildlife, for actions that you can take to benefit wildlife in, in middle-aged stands. There's a lot of room for improvement there. And then obviously older forests is the, the third classification that we divide uh, our habitat into. And this is where they, you know, larger trees, more varied and complex canopy, developed understory, you start to see that structure, which you can really see in the photo here. And then um, this is where you start to get, I just picked three of my very favorite photos to include here, but you can get things like Northern goshawk, a lot of red tail hawk, red shouldered hawk. But the photos here, this is the um, Humboldt Martin, and then another photo of the North Spotted Owl. You can see the mouse thinking about its fate right here. And then I can never resist putting in these two pictures of the fisher. These are fisher um, young and in the hands of a scientist doing research down in Northern California and Southern Oregon. So we're gonna do one more poll here. And while Julie starts that, actually, maybe I'll just let Julie start that. We'll do the poll first. And then I'll, this looks like a terrible photo, but it's actually a really great video, which I'll share with you after the poll. And so, um, actually, I'll go ahead and put it up. So this poll, we're, we're asking you really, and this isn't like where you think you might see most wildlife, but it's on you know on your forest where are you where are you finding wildlife and I think you'll be able to see this while I while you're doing the poll and listen to the video Psst, what are you doing no 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 <laughs> go away So I hope you all enjoyed that video. It's uh, obviously our friends, the striped skunk, which are super cool species. Um, they're an omnivore. They eat all kinds of stuff, and uh, but you don't want to have an encounter with one. And that you heard John in the video, um, and uh, he, John works for me, and he was out doing surveys this summer and had that encounter. He was lucky; he did not actually get sprayed by the skunk. But I just love how he tells it to go away. Um, so it looks like it's really pretty evenly split here on the um, poll. Looks like 19% see, mostly see wildlife in young forests, 15 in middle, 17% in mature forests, and then, uh, and then the rest is like mixed or other. And, um, and none of you have never seen wildlife. So that's great. And you know what, this, this poll is so, so great that it turned out this way. And we didn't plan it obviously, but that just really highlights one of our main points in our wildlife managed forest program, which is the all of these age classes are important for wildlife and they all provide habitat for wildlife. So you just made the best point that I could make. So I appreciate that. There we go. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into the priority actions for wildlife. And our newest publication through the Wildlife and Managed Forest Program is this Oregon Forest as Habitat publication. And some of you are probably thinking right now, wait a minute, I've seen that before. Um, and it, we've just completely revised it. So the old version has the pileated woodpecker on the front and the new version has the, um, these four, four species on the front. And so that's how you know if you have the most up-to-date version. And of course, if we weren't in a Zoom meeting um, and we were all in person, we would have handed you a copy, but it's in the resources section that has probably just popped up on your chat window to remind you where those are located. And then also you can order them from us online. So we can, we can provide those too if you want a hard copy. And so in there, we walk you through all these priority actions for wildlife. So that's what we're gonna do next. I'll go through all these points individually. So the first thing, and these aren't in, it's not like first reach, you know, they're not in order of priority. These are all priority actions for wildlife. And what's important to note there is, you know, many of you have 
um, you all have different size of forest, which is really great. And it may not make sense for you to implement some of these priority actions on your forest, but some of them will speak to you and some won't, and that's okay. We don't have any expectation that you could do everything on every acre. We know it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work like that, but you're looking for opportunities across the landscape. So the first thing that um, on this is to retain, create, and recruit, recruit legacy structure. And what I find so important about this, are, you know, if you see in this photo, you're looking at these big trees like this. And anytime we have those across the landscape, you want to just, uh, you know, take, make a little wildlife sign and tack it on there or put a W on the tree or just GPS it or just take a mental note that that's one of your wildlife trees that you're going to maintain uh, into the future. And then equally important as these big downed logs. We do a great job with a lot of things in forestry. Um, one of the things that I think we could do better is, is identifying these trees and letting them grow to those, grow really big and leaving them across the landscape. And so along with that is creating this forest structure. And so you can look for opportunities to do this in a number of ways. One of the ways is you can plant a variety of species. Douglas fir is uh, the most popular species to plant. It's certainly a favorite in our family, but we also have patches of uh, Western red cedar. And we have, I think my parents are on this call, so they're probably gonna pop in the chat window some of the other species we've planted because I won't come up with them all. But Western hemlock, um, we have some pretty unique species out there too that my dad has planted. Um, so that's one way to create forest structure. You can also, um, again, identify those large old trees and maintain them. Um, any existing snags on the landscape, definitely keep those as long as it's safe to do so. And then in the photo here, you can see these are clearly created snags. And there's a couple of things to note here. Um, one, they, this one is created out of, um, you know, a, a tree that probably wasn't going to have a lot of value at the mill. And so it's perfect for wildlife. These are small and that's okay, a small created snag does provide quite a bit of habitat, especially for like chickadees and nuthatches, anything that um, cavity nesters that are, will require a smaller diameter tree. So they provide great habitat in the short term. They won't persist across the landscape in the long term. So just know that they are a short term habitat feature. And anytime you create a snag, you can see on this one, there's this limb out like this. You wanna make sure to leave a limb, um, they make great raptor perches. So you kind of get a twofer there. Um, however, um, I always promote retaining existing snags over creation of snags and also identifying a living tree that you want to have become a snag. It's uh, the tree then gets bigger and will last on, on the landscape longer. Uh, you can also look at uh, your how you plant your trees and you can plant them in an irregular pattern or vary the spacing and that can lead to structure as well. And another way to do that is to create small gaps and openings if a stand like in a thinning operation. And then another priority action for wildlife is the retention of shrubs and broadleaf trees. And I just, I can't emphasize this enough that it's food for wildlife and incredibly important, even if it's just one tree. So this is a clump of Pacific Madrone, but if you even just have one Madrone tree on your property, that's an important feature to maintain. If you have one Oregon white oak tree on your property, that's a great piece to, you know, a great thing to maintain. Um, we've put a couple of our example species in here that are important for wildlife. Um, noting that these can compete with um, your trees, you know, trees that you're trying to grow for, um, for production. So just be mindful of where and when you're keeping these um, trees for wildlife and then just be intentional about that. And then uh, another aspect of um, or priority action for wildlife is maintaining these well-vegetated riparian buffers. And a lot of that's covered through the Oregon Forest Practice Rules because the required buffer widths are laid out for you anytime you do a timber operation. And this is just an aerial view of a very well vegetated riparian area. This is out on um, 
on Port Blakely property. But one thing that um, to consider on your property is whether or not you have springs or seeps or maybe a headwater area or, um, or a wetland and whether or not you wanna make a buffer around that as part of your management plan. Those aren't necessarily covered in the forest practice rules but can be critically important for species like the Columbia or Southern Torrent salamanders, as well as quite a few other species. And then I left this, this is a, just a still shot of that same riparian corridor, but to really um, think about connectivity and that can be sort of a daunting concept because connectivity can be very different depending on what species you're thinking about. So for instance, you might be thinking on a very small scale, like can I make it possible for um, wildlife to cross streams? So maybe I just want, you know, for, for small mammals that can't swim or something, just to make sure there's, you know, a log across the stream on my property. Or perhaps you want, um, you're thinking on a much bigger scale. And so you're looking at this riparian zone and you're like, oh, there's, you know, all these trees back here. And I know there's trees here and I wanna provide a way for wildlife to move through a cover because they wouldn't, you know, some wouldn't wanna move through this clear cut for fear of being eaten by a predator. Or maybe you're thinking about this little feathered edge along the back of this photo and providing a way for um, wildlife to move in this direction. So there's a lot of different ways to think about connectivity so if you only own five acres and you're like, oh, you know, connectivity isn't something that's really important to me, it very well may be because you might have a stream that you need to provide a crossing, or maybe you have a culvert and you need to think about whether or not wildlife can get through your culvert. There's, it can be at any scale. And just a side note, if you all can hear that, my dog is snoring at my feet. And uh, so if you're hearing that, that's what you're hearing. Um, so another, and this is kind of a new concept, this creation of habitat piles and biodens. We're not talking about slash piles. Slash piles can be great for wildlife um, right up until you burn them. And so habitat piles and biodens are intentionally left on the landscape and aren't burned. This here is a bioden and you can see it's created from, it's, this is a, you're looking right down on it and it's created from leftover logging slash and these are those big pieces. I don't ever want to see these big pieces in a pile that's going to be burned. These are so important for wildlife. So you can pile them up into a bioden like this, or you can just leave them loose. But if you pile them, um, you want to create space underneath. And they can be used for escape from predators, a place to den, rest, their cover. They're, they create forage opportunities. And here's another example. You might recognize the folks in this photo, Lauren. Grand and Gordon Colbertson, and they built this bioden um, from the slash from the spinning operation that they did. So this one has a lot more structure to it. It's much more engineered. And this is great too. Same kind of thing. You'll get, um, you actually, you might not know who you're going to get using this. So you could put up a wildlife camera to see. I have a very similar structure on some property that I manage in Washington. It's about a thousand acres. And we just built a few of these and put uh, exactly the same thing from a thinning operation and we put up wildlife cameras. And so far we've had about 16 different species come look, uh, come look, investigate, forage, hang out at the, um, at the biodens. We're pretty excited about that. And so then just to summarize part one for you, the, you know, we had in our poll the various acres that everybody has from, from zero to over a thousand and keeping those forests as forests is so important. So I appreciate that everybody's keeping their working forests working. And then to think about the fact that these working and managed forests have such a role to play for wildlife. You're seeing those wildlife occur on um, every age of forest. And so all those ages are important and that we have a lot of priority actions that are available to you to take for wildlife. So again, to remind you that we don't think that you're gonna do everything on every acre, but to think about those opportunities and, um, and see where they can apply for, you know, where it applies on your landscape. And then also just, I can never say it enough to really think about those hardwood trees and shrubs. And then don't do things accidentally, you know, think about it in an intentional way. What are your goals for wildlife and how do you wanna be intentional on it on your property? 
And we'll get more into those, how you set those goals in section two. But right now, I think Thomas is gonna come back on and we can do a few questions. Great, thanks, Fran. Uh, so yeah, we've got a few questions already. Uh, the first one is what age would you consider middle-aged forests? This is kind of a trick question almost. <laughs> it's not a trick question. And it's, you know, I think like I need a forester for that part, right? But we think about it after it's closed canopy. And that's such a great question because I know when I participate in the Red Tree Bowl working group, they're always talking about these young forests and, and I always have to have them classify because when they say young forest, they mean like 80 years old, right? To them, that's a young forest. So um, to me, a young forest, which I know you asked middle age, but I'm just gonna go through it. A young forest is like, you know, age zero to 15 to 20. And then, and, uh, and then middle age would be like 20 to 40. And then older is 40 and above, I think. What do you think, Thomas? Does that sound about right? Yeah, and, and it, it, you know, like you mentioned, it kind of depends on what you're looking at. But when it comes to that middle age, we think of it as more of, um, you know, that closed canopy, you've got some, um, density dependent mortality. So some competition going on between the young trees. And once it gets to that old structure, you see uh, canopy gaps forming, uh, bigger trees falling over, uh, younger trees growing in the understory, so. That's right. And through those, some of those actions for creating that structure, you can get some of that older structure in a much younger stand. Right, and management is obviously gonna influence uh, the rate at which a forest grows, so. yeah. Um, cool. So another one uh, was asking about the wildfires. Um, how, so the fires in the McKenzie, how will it affect wildlife if such large areas were affected so that we're hmm. only going to have young forests, we're no longer going to have older forests in that area? How is that going to affect? Oh. Well, so, so certainly the wildlife was affected by all these fires, definitely. And any and that's such a great question to ask because any action that you take for wildlife, there's going to be a winner and there's going to be a loser because they use habitat in different ways. So, um, and then, and it's not that there won't be any older forest out there on the McKinsey. That, that's, um, so I've just recently been out there. One of my, uh, our family's property is out by Deerhorn. Uh, the firefighters actually stopped the fire about a thousand feet from our gate. Um, so we're so grateful that it didn't burn. So that's quite a bit of old, that's uh, a little over 70 acres of older uh, forest there. Some of it's young, but we've got some older forest. There's some some BLM ground next door to us that didn't burn. And then I was way up, way up Gate Creek. And so it didn't, it didn't just burn straight through. Um, so there are, there's still a mosaic out there on the landscape. Um, so Hopefully that cheers people up a little bit about what's out there. Uh, and, and also I've been working with um, a few of the landowners that were affected by the holiday farm fire, um, as well as the beachy and Riverside. And we've been working with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we've got about um, so far um, 14,000 pounds of wildlife friendly seed mix that are gonna be going out on the fire. So that'll help prevent uh, erosion and then also um, provide um, food for for wildlife, given that some of that uh, has been burned up. However, it like it's already regrowing. So, um, and I'm not a fire expert. I should totally say that too. I'm not a fire expert. But <laughs> so there's gonna be winners and losers. Um, winners and losers to the fire, for sure. Yeah, and, and as you mentioned, some of those fire, you know, some of those areas were patchy burns, and I imagine some of those larger legacy, um, large diameter trees, some might have made it, and the ones that died are going to end up being great snags. Um, you know, when it comes to fire, there's a lot of different species of benefit, as Fran said, so that's a great question. Um, we've got another one on, um, you know, kind of the trade-offs between revenue and diversity. So. As a manager, you have a responsibility to produce revenue. With regard to planting tree species diversity, there seems to be a disconnect. Why are most commercial timberlands on the west side of the Cascades uh, homogenous planted, mostly in Douglas fir, which lasts, lacks diversity? 
so I think the, I'm hearing that the question is why why do we mostly plant Douglas fir? And right. I mean, I think compared to a yeah. species mix, and is there a disconnect between the diversity and the economics? Yeah, so some of these goals, you know, that don't perfectly align, um, and and that's okay. I think you have to think about how your, you know, what are your goals? You have you have goals for for growing um, trees to make money, and and you have to watch the markets and plant the right trees for that. A hundred percent. You may also have wildlife goals, and so there are areas on your property that maybe aren't going to grow Douglas fir as well, or just that these wildlife goals are something you are willing to give some revenue up for. Um, I believe it's about finding that balance and looking for the opportunities to create habitat for wildlife. Um, and, and, I, and I know it can be done and still produce um, Douglas fir trees for the mill, absolutely. It also depends on where you are. I work with um, a client in Northwest Oregon that owns about 130,000 acres and they plant uh, spruce, hemlock, and Douglas fir, and western red cedar. So it kind of just depends on where you are on what tree species you're planting as well. So I wouldn't say that it's all exclusively Douglas fir anymore. OK, so um, so are there specifics for biodens explained in Oregon forests as habitat publication? And does that level of engineering need to be planned or will just any pile work for a bio? Oh, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. So, so there's a few, there's, there are a few resources for how to make a biodent. So we definitely talk about it in the Oregon Forest's Habitat publication. Um, there's also, uh, and Julie will know when this is coming out, but there's a my brother's working on a slash pile publication from the Department of Forestry. That's more about how to burn piles, but since his sister is a wildlife biologist, we have a segment in there about how to differentiate between a slash pile that you're going to burn and a bioden that you're going to keep. And then you can have any habitat pile, think small, bioden, think big. Those, they can be really small and not very engineered. So you want to think, put the bigger pieces on the bottom and then pile the smaller pieces on top so it can filter down through. And you, the biggest thing to think about is if I were a critter, could I get into this pile? So is there space underneath it? Is there a spot where I can you know, quickly dive away from a coyote or is there a, or if I'm a coyote, is there a spot for me to cozy on in there? So you're just thinking about space. If you're just piling, you know, pruning slash, you know, those are just the little pieces. That's okay too. You can make smaller piles and that'll be used um, by different species. Like a lot of times what I actually see on these uh, biodens and is uh, songbirds. I think I answered. Did I get that answer, Thomas? Yes, I, I believe, um, at least as far as I'm concerned, I, you know, when it comes to the wood piles, you know, here on the east side, you got to be really careful because you can kind of with green fresh slash, uh, specifically pine slash, you can cause problems for the yips, pine engraver. And on the west side, um, Douglas fir, you can attract Douglas fir beetles. So you want to make sure that's all well dried out by the spring. Um, yeah. And so larger diameter uh, logs might be better, you know, might be better for wildlife, uh, but might attract that ips, or sorry, not the ips, but the Douglas fir beetle. But in terms of the wildlife, you know, I think the large diameter stuff is good for certain species like the salamanders, um, lizards, and then the smaller slash might make better dens for something like say a porcupine over here on the east side. Right. Um, okay, so it looks like we still have some time, right? For more questions? Uh, do we have a few more questions? Yeah, I think we have a little yeah, bit Yeah, we've more. got quite a bit more actually. <laughs> Okay, good. Um, Let's do a few more. Julie will tell us maybe if we have, if we don't have enough time. So one person asked what kind of, um, you know, when you put a camera trap up, um, what are some of the, someone asked, what are the, some of the 16 species you found on the camera? Oh yeah. Um, so, so we found, so there was an elk visiting it. We've had numerous um, uh, black-tailed deer. We've had uh, Stellar's Jay. 
we've had spotted tohi. Um, oh, you're not, I can't come up with all 16 on the fly. I can't do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> kind of random, right? Yeah, we did have, um, we did have, uh, um, I didn't identify it to species, but like a ground squirrel. Um, yeah, and this is in a, this is totally in a middle-aged stand. It's like a 25 year old stand that um, we just thinned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've got camera traps and it's amazing the types of different critters you get. I even had an owl on mine. I think it was pretty sure it was a barred owl. Couldn't really tell because of the night shot, but yeah, it's amazing what you can capture with camera traps. And someone did ask, you know, what they prefer in terms of camera traps. Um, but a lot of researchers do use Bushnells as sort of a cheap alternative. And which yeah. Reconyx is more of the high end for camera traps. Right. So there's a, a lot of and different ones. There's a lot of different ones. And I would think about um, where you're going to put it and how much money you're going to spend on it. Because if it's in a place that could get stolen or damaged, then maybe go for a slightly cheaper option. Okay. Um, one person asked, are Nutria considered wildlife? Should they be, they be left alone? And allowed to expand. That's a oh well. Really question. <laughs> nutria are wildlife for sure, but they are an introduced species. They're they're a nuisance and a pest, and they outcompete native species. And uh, for me personally, I, that's something I struggle with. Right, I struggle with invasive species because um, you know I don't I don't really like to kill animals. Um, it's it's not really my thing. Um, on the other hand the more nutria we have, then the less native species are gonna be able to thrive in those same ecosystems. So they use the same systems as river otter and mink and muskrat and beaver. And so, you know, we would, for me personally, I would value those species native to Oregon over the nutria. And so I don't believe that they should be left to expand. I think they need to be controlled. Excellent. Yeah. And that goes into a couple other questions that somebody had about dealing with invasive critters. I'll just state that you're probably going to want to contact your local uh, APHIS contact. Uh, they're the animal or agriculture pest inspection something services. So they deal with invasive species um, and also and not just invasive species, but uh, damage to agricultural crops um, as well and, and forestry crops. So um, it's your best bet to get a hold of APHIS, and I don't know if you have anything else to add, but on a follow-up for that regarding Nutria, what good do beavers do? Oh, <laughs> yeah, so there's, so the American beaver is super cool species, uh, not to be confused with the mountain beaver, so if, if anyone's wondering about those two species, uh, American beaver is the one with the big tail found in river systems, mountain beavers are the ones uh, that, that might clip your seedlings. And so they're very different. So the American beaver is, uh, they're great. They're, they're considered like the engineers, right, of the natural world. And so they create habitat for fish. They, uh, when they dam up the river, they can, they make wetlands that uh, can be uh, great for waterfowl. Um, however, they can also uh, quite quickly eat a lot of riverside vegetation, including um, tree species that you may have planted there on purpose. So they, they aren't without conflict. They uh, also can, when they dam up streams, can cause flooding issues on people's property or road damage by, um, by plugging culverts. So we do have an, a whole publication on the American beaver through our wildlife and managed forests program that really highlight, highlights a lot of Jimmy Taylor and Vanessa Petro's work uh, in their research. And so I would encourage folks that are interested in beaver uh, to take a look at that publication. Yeah, and, and they also asked um, how to help them continue building dams if it's a good thing. You know, we actually use these, what we call beaver dam analogs to, uh, which are essentially those big, large wood piles in the stream to sort of raise, um, you know, to let the stream spread out, that benefits wetland, you know, the wetland vegetation, um, willows, vegetation the beavers will select as forage. Um, and that's one way, you know, it's, they're really forage limited. So you can't just expect beavers are gonna start building dams um, 
you know, it really, and, and I would recommend that publication because it, it's not as simple as beavers always build dams because they don't always build dams. They don't. That's, that's such a good point, Thomas. They don't, it's not like they're just looking to build the dam. They do it when they need to. <laughs> we've still got some questions coming in. Um, we've still got five more minutes left. Uh, should we keep going or with the questions or? Julie says yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's my favorite part of the question answer. One person did say they want to put a plug in for mountain beaver. They're native and really unique primitive species of wildlife. Yeah. Despite the damage they cause, they're like a really ancient creature, um, which is they're pretty super cool. cool. Absolutely. And they don't always cause damage. Like that's not a sure yeah. thing. And it can be managed around for sure. Um, yeah. And my mom would always point out to you that they, they build separate chambers. So like and they they have a chamber for storing their food. They have a chamber for storing waste, a uh, chamber for raising their young. Um, yeah, they're very cool. I quite agree. Um, and so we've got this one that's, you know, in my opinion, pretty complicated, but um, do you have some examples of well-intentioned interventions that do more harm than good? So an example of maybe something that had an adverse consequence when it comes to creating wildlife habitat. It's really well, I think maybe an unintended consequence, right? So like you you might make you might take an action for wildlife and not get the species you were thinking of. So like maybe upland game birds are your thing. You want turkey and grouse on your property. And so you put out a wildlife friendly seed mix targeting those species. Well, that same species mix is really similar to what deer and elk might be interested in. So maybe now all of a sudden you've got more deer and elk than using your property than you were hoping for and they might nibble on your seedlings. And so maybe that's not something you were going for. Um, I don't personally have, uh, have an example of an action that I've taken that that didn't go well, um, which I hope that doesn't sound lofty. I don't mean it that way. I might have gotten something I didn't mean. So like we, I have a program where we put nest boxes out for wood ducks and we haven't gotten a lot of wood ducks, but we've gotten a lot of hooded mergansers. Well, I love her and their gansers. That's okay by me. Like I'm still trying for the wood duck, but you just never know who's gonna come in and use what you provide. Right. And yeah, in terms of unintended consequences, one person asked about the wild turkey populations doubling annually in some areas. <laughs> and um, they asked, you know, besides hunting, is there any way that they can build habitat for natural turkey predators? Well, you know, like um, there's plenty of predators that will eat the uh, eggs, you know, like raccoons, for example, coyotes will eat the turkeys themselves and the young the eggs. But then again, you know, like Fran was pointing out, um, that could then re result in, you know, some other consequence to potentially native species. But um, when it comes to the turkey control, yeah, I think, what are the main predators, Fran? Yeah, uh, coyote, bobcat, uh, those, are, those are the two that come to mind, right? Raccoons. Straight off. Yeah, Scott raccoons. Really the eggs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Snakes, I think some, you know, like the gopher snake will eat eggs. Yep. Turkeys. So. Yeah, that's that's a good point. When you start thinking about, you know, you know how you're playing with these systems, and so I I think I think less about the individual species and more about the habitats that I have control over. So, um, and think about what actions improve improve the habitat with the goal of increasing the biodiversity, the number of different kinds of species that can use that habitat type on my property. So, or on my family's property. Um, and then if you're wondering, you know, what what's happening out there with, you know, with the actions that you're taking and you should be wondering, then you want to, you know, walk your property, keep a list of the species that you're seeing. Maybe you put up a game camera, but just keep notes on, on the changes that you're seeing and monitor that to the time. And if you're like, okay, I planted 
uh, I ripped out all this scotch broom and I've planted all these native species and, and now I'm seeing the results of my actions. And if you don't like those results, then you know maybe you plant a different suite of native species back in there. You know, like you can tweak your actions as you go. Okay, it looks like we're um, out of time for this section of questions. <laughs> we will have questions at the end. We will. Uh, thanks a lot, Fran. That was great. And I will now pass it on to Julie. Yes. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, great questions. Appreciate all those coming in and uh, appreciate all that Fran shared with us in the first part about you know, actions we can take for wildlife, things to think about for wildlife. So as many of you indicated at the beginning of this that you own forest or manage forest are um, of course interested in this topic. And we didn't wanna just talk about what you can do for wildlife. We also wanted to give some examples of how we've um, been applying that. And so I'm part of managing the rediscovery forest and we've had a forest management plan for some time, but the last few years we really decided to make it intentional to have a wildlife plan as part of that. And so we're gonna take through how we incorporate that as part of our forest management plan and some things we thought about, um, not only the planning for the wildlife, but those um, you know, priority species and the other things that we're going to want to include in that plan. So hopefully you've gone to this page, Oregon Forest Management Planning. You can get it to it through Know Your Forest or you can go uh, Google it this way too. And this is a collaborative of, um, group that has put this together. And on this page, you can get a template that has the forest management planning. So it's the full plan, but also as part of that is the wildlife, a wildlife plan. And so that's where we started at the Rediscovery Forest. And the great thing about this template is it's a collaborative of all these different partners, much like who've also helped with Tree School, but um, have contributed to the plan. And so it's a, a partnership. And the great thing is then all, all of it's kind of in one spot. And it's a, a really good place for you to start from. And so at the Rediscovery Forest, um, which if you've been out here, you may know we have some variety here. but. When we started this plan for wildlife, we these are some questions that Fran helped us think about. And um, it's really great to bring on a, a, a specialist or just even have a conversation, much as if you'd hire a consulting forester, maybe if you're doing a plan or have some questions. It's also sometimes great to bring someone that has that expertise in biology, whether it's a survived biologist or someone from the Department of Fish and Wildlife or um, a variety of different, even soil and water conservation districts have people that can come talk to you about wildlife. And so some things we just started with, we're thinking about, do we have a map? And do we have a map that is not only showing our forest, but maybe our um, desired habitats or what maybe we have some specialty habitats. And then thinking about how can we use some of these priority species guides that are out there um, also as part of our plan to make sure we're, we're really trying to think about um, the whole gamut of those different wildlife. And so one of the things um, when we, went out is we also spent some time starting in the rediscovery forest. So go to your forest. And if you've been here, it's a 15 acre forest that is part of the Oregon garden. So the Oregon garden is 80 acres and we have some other surrounding forests, but we were really looking at a part of the rediscovery forest, which um, is primarily started as a Douglas fir forest. And we've over time knew what we wanted to do with the forest. We wanted to increase that diversity and we also wanted to enhance, we have an oak grove with heritage trees over 400 years old. So we have this real mix of some really older forest along with um, this young forest. And it is a working forest. Uh, so we're actively out harvesting, replanting. And we also have students and people out in the forest. That's a, a big part of our forest here is um, we constantly are inviting people out for programs and workshops. And so as you can see, we have this diversity of Douglas fir, Lent Valley Ponderosa pine, some hardwood, our older forest, and even an oak pine savanna, and then um, some Christmas trees. So a real mix in a small area. And um, you know, for a long time, we were focused on the forest as far as what can we do as the management and not thinking about also what we can do as part of our habitat. And so that became a, a great mindset for us to get around all these ideas that Fran was um, incorporating as far as, you know, what can we do? What are we already doing? And how can we be more intentional for managing for wildlife? And so these were some of the things that we um, sat down and, and talked about in our plan. What wildlife do we already have? Where are those habitat features? 
Um, we don't have a lot of water right in the forest, but we have some next to it. And we know that water is important for the wildlife. Um, you know, what wildlife and habitat do we want to promote or encourage? And then what wildlife might present a challenge? Uh, as Fran mentioned, there may be some you don't want on your forest. Here in a more public setting, we had cougar sightings and we knew those weren't probably something we wanted to promote even more habitat for, because uh, we we're again right on that edge of a town. Um, so the first thing we did was we actually went out and we started recording what we saw were our common species. And so, uh, you know, some of these were really easy for us to identify. We knew we could see deer and variety of snakes and we put up those game cameras. We even had students out looking for tracks. Um, we had, you know, variety of people that were different levels of birders. And for several years, we knew we had a, a pair of pileated woodpeckers. And so we actually had put up um, pileated woodpecker boxes. And you can see, I'm not a great birder, but I even knew that that is not a pileated woodpecker using the pileated woodpecker box. And so sometimes we'd call in a, like the phone a friend, we'd phone a biologist and uh, we'd say, Fran, we're finding some of these cool things. We know what these are, but what, what are these other things we're finding? I was wondering if we're going to see anybody in the chat window guessing what this species is. Uh, so for some bird ID, you think, well, definitely not a woodpecker, even though we put up a woodpecker box. Um, but you're looking at a little western screech owl in this, uh, using this. So again, you don't know what you're going to get, but who wouldn't want this? It's so great. Yeah, and so we um, once we had an idea of what our common species, it really helped us start thinking about um, you know what's using it out there, what features are they using. So we went back to that template and we looked at description of desired species and habitat. So what only did we have already, and then what did we want to promote? And we really found um, birds of all different species was kind of our angle that we felt we had good habitat for. It worked well with people love coming out and seeing the birds. And that's something we felt we could even promote more of out here with bird boxes and different things that we could even um, you know, maintain over time. Um, so a part of this template you'll also see, and not that you're, you have to read that, but if you go into that template or if you, we've heard us talk about, you know, is one thing you wanna do is identify your priority species or what species might also be in your area. And that's where it gets a little bit trickier, tricky that you may not know exactly what you have because sometimes those are harder to do that identification. And so there's some really great resources. You can find those out and, uh, and Fran's gonna share some of the resources of how to help get you started to answer those questions you might find in the template. Awesome. So the, we use two main sources when I helped Julie with the, her, the wildlife portion of her forest management plan. And the first is this Oregon um, Forest Resources Institute publication again through the, um, and I think I mentioned it earlier in my presentation, it's this little guy. Um, it's got the pica on the front. We've updated this publication a number of times, so you want to make sure you have the one with the pica. And if you're already thinking, well, um, I don't really know what a priority species is, fair enough. There's a lot of different ways to define priority species. How we mean it in this book is anything that has a special status that's also found in a forested environment. So that means if it's on the threatened and endangered species list, if it's covered under the Oregon Forest Practices Act, if it's an Oregon Conservation Strategy species, or if it's a G1, G2, or G3. And if you're already thinking that's a lot of definitions to know, um, we've got a little snapshot of the table of contents. And just in the first few pages of the book, we go through all of what those definitions are. And then um, also on the table of contents here, you can see we have an ecoregion index. So for each ecoregion in Oregon, we provide a list of all of the priority species that are found there. So here's an example of what that looks like. So the Klamath Mountains ecoregion uh, will have this little picture and then it'll have a description about the ecoregion. And on the subsequent page, it will have a list of all the species found in this section. So if you're in the, <clears throat> so you can, you can look that way. You can also, once you have that list of species, then you can go right to the species pages. So if I just go back for a second, you can see that it's organized by amphibians and reptiles, birds, invertebrates, mammals, plants, or plants. And so then here's a couple examples of what those pages look like. So for the organ spotted frog, it, you can, you know, it's it's a really small range map, but still you can have a pretty good idea if, you're, if your property is in that range map or not. We have the county outlines on it. And then we talk about what their preferred forest habitat is. 
So wetlands located near ponds, lakes, and slow running streams. So that's pretty handy for if you're, you know, you know where your property is, you know what ecoregion you're in by using the priority species guide. And then you can take a look at these species and figure out if you have that habitat type or not. And you can do it for plants as well. Um, so the threatened and endangered species are located in the priority species guide, but there's other ways to know more about these. And they're important to know about because obviously they're on the threatened and endangered species list. So though we all like to think beyond that management to common species, um, we do need to think about it. Um, and there's a, a number of ways to figure that out. One way is to talk to your stewardship forester and they will for sure let you know about known occurrences of threatened and endangered species. Um, there's no requirement in Oregon to do surveys. However, if you have habitat on your property for threatened and endangered species, it's probably worth a look. Um, <clears throat> and then you can use the, like we said, we can use the priority species guide. And then there's another resource that some of you may or may not have heard of, and that's this U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service IPAC. So I use this all the time, and it's super easy to use. The website's shown up here. It's also in the resources section on the list of links that we provided you. And you can go right to this website and you'll see it has a little button that says get started or log in. So you don't need to create a login. I have never logged in. I just click right on get started. And so I did this for Julie for the um, Oregon Garden. And so when you click get started, it brings you to a whole map of Oregon. And I've already zoomed in. I say it's Oregon, it might be the entire United States, but you can quickly zoom to your area of interest and it'll allow you to draw a polygon. So you click on the polygon and then you can just draw it around your property and then you click okay and it allows you to print out a, um, the data. And when you print the data out, it'll save it as a PDF for you. And it looks like this. So you get this IPAC resource list and then it, gives you this whole blurb about the endangered species, which I don't think I've ever actually read. So you wanna to skip to the good stuff. So then it starts giving you a list. And so here it showed that we might have the Northern Spotted Owl or the Streaked Horned Lark, which you've seen in the photos we've shown you in this presentation. So that's when you think a little bit about the habitat for these species. This is pretty general. So the Oregon Garden does not have habitat for Northern Spotted Owls. So we know we don't have to worry about it. Um, but one of the coolest things that it gives you, so you get through all that, it will also tell you if, they're, if you're within critical habitat for any species. So that's up here at the top talking about critical habitat. But then it also tells you if you have migratory birds and the probability of their presence. So that's pretty cool. So on this one, it told us that we might have uh, great blue heron, bald eagle, or um, rufous hummingbird. So if you're wondering, like, you're like, I care about wildlife, but I don't really know where to start this list could provide you with some ideas. Maybe you love roof of hummingbirds. They're a pollinator, super cool species, pretty easy to manage for. Could help you create some goals around that species in general. Um, and then just a note about the um, Oregon Forest Practice Act species. Of course, um, ODF is gonna tell you if those are there, um, if you ask them. Again, it's only the known locations. So as you're getting to know your property, um, they might not know about the eagle nest on your property. And so, it, um, you know, this would still require protection and you'd want to alert the Department of Forestry about that site. So as you see, um, you know, we, we look through what was our priority species, what might be threatened dangerous species in our area. And then we wanted to take all that information we had gathered in those first couple uh, things that we talked about and then really start thinking about our goals and actions. And so here's a couple examples, um, you know, encourage you. So the forest for wildlife species, such as the raptors, woodpeckers, songbirds, and the small mammals. Um, and so for example, you know, we mentioned we have an oak grove and we have this acorn woodpecker and we definitely had activity from acorn woodpeckers. And so that was a species we wanted to make sure we kept providing that habitat for. Um, even though we came back without the threatened and endangered, having a really known threatened and endangered species on the site or a um, 
you know, a specific thing we needed to protect. We still wanted that as a goal because as we know, those lists also change over time and it's also something for us to watch for a monitor. And so we made that one of our goals of, of still protecting those or encouraging them and then keeping an eye on making, you know, revisiting that list that Fran shared every few years um, and keeping an eye if things had changed in our area. And so we took these goals and then we created them into actions. And so again, um, with that idea of you know, promoting more birds, the raptors, woodpeckers, songbirds, um, what could we do? So some of the things we did, as mentioned, we created some of the um, boxes. We also need to make sure we were maintaining them and how we were gonna do that. We did, um, we've leave down wood, we've created snags, we've tried to leave, um, you know, some of the piles where we weren't maybe having a lot of people walking through. So trying to promote um, some of those actions on the ground while also trying to think about our other goals and objectives as well. And so, um, one of the things is that you also need to think about to tie this back into remember at the beginning where we said each age of forest does promote different habitat. And so here at the forest, um, that's what every time that we're creating that habitat or we're thinking about forest or aging, we also want to think about how, uh, what, for, what animals might be, right, what species might be considering that as habitat. So again, much like those management plans that can't stay on the shelf forever, even with wildlife plans, we need to be thinking about as the forest grow, what are we providing and how is it changing and, and what are we seeing out there? So it really is a dynamic plan that changes as your forest grow or if um, you, know, you have disturbances such as we talked about the fires, what does that look like for now? So um, I'll turn this back over to Fran to talk a little bit more about how, again, thinking about um, as your forests grow or if you're in those different stages, how might it look different from the rediscovery forest? Awesome. So the way we think about it is, so just kind of to, to bring it home from, the, from section one to section two, we talked about all those different um, priority actions for wildlife and how those might look for a young forest. So, um, for young forests, what I think, um, the things that I think about are the retention of shrubs. So this is um, huckleberry here. So if you, you know, you would, that's a really important species for wildlife. So um, I just have that to highlight that, um, you know, it could be cascara, it could be elderberry, um, to think about how, what's your plan for, for shrub uh, retention in your young forests. You might also think about um, your planting spacing in your young forest. Am I gonna plant things maybe a little bit wider so it stays a young forest longer? Cause I know that's a really uh, productive time for songbirds. Um, you also, it's a good time to know, you can see what snags you have uh, across your uh, landscape when the forest is young. So you can identify those for retention. Um, and then I, um, you might have the slash piles left from the previous harvest and what's your plan for those? Are they, are, did you make any intentionally or are you just new to the habitat pile concept? And so what you have are, are slash piles. So then you have to decide if you're gonna burn them or not. Um, and then for the, this is my niece here, here who's now in college. So it's a little bit of an older photo. Um, and we did, we did end up burning that pile after she was out of it. Um, so middle age stands. So this photo, the middle age stands in the background. But the reason I picked this photo is for seeing these single wildlife trees out in the unit, and um, and thinking about when you plan for those. Do you plan for those at the final harvest? But they can be identified at any age. And middle age stands, you might be thinking about what these trees are going to look like in the future. And a side note for trees like this, they're great for the um, olive-sided flycatcher. So that's a, a um, something to think about. Uh, Middle-aged stands is a great time to think about gaps. So when you're doing your thinning operation, depending on the size forest you have, that's when I would be thinking, can I make a half acre gap here? Could I make a food plot? Um, are there opportunities for habitat piles? What's my understory vegetation look like? Do I have any? Uh, how can I increase that? Do I have, um, what are the road system through my middle-aged forest? Could I put a wildlife friendly seed mix along the road? Do I have a plan for pollinators? What's the downwood? So those are all things to think about at the middle age. And then older forests, again, gaps, good time to identify those wildlife trees. Think more critically about the understory vegetation. Is there a way to promote that at final harvest? Could you 
could you protect some of that understory vegetation? What does a downwood look like? Is there a way to retain more? This particular uh, log, this you can see it's been torn apart here and that was torn apart by a black bear, which is pretty cool. And it was witnessed by one of my biologists. He didn't get a photo of the black bear, but he got a photo of the aftermath. And then also just thinking ahead for what is it gonna look like uh, as the stand um, reestablishes. And so from section one and section two, if you didn't hear us say it quite enough, um, we're really wanting you to be intentional about your management for wildlife and think about specific goals that um, make sense for your property, given all the things that you've learned today. And that all of us have a role to play for wildlife management. The management of the wildlife in Oregon is, is everybody's responsibility and, and keeping forests as forests is, is, is a really important um, aspect of that goal. We've shown you a few online tools. So there's a lot out there to help you. And um, again, to just emphasize that all four stages provide habitat for wildlife and to think critically about which goals and objectives you wanna implement at each age of forest. And then just remember that there are a lot of resources out there to help you. So I think if we didn't get all your questions answered before, we can answer some now. Great, yeah, we've still got some coming in. Um, let's see, one person uh, mentioned uh, the fact that herbicides haven't really been discussed in this talk so far. Can you, can you speak to um, herbicides? Sure, what do they wanna know? Do they have anything specific? Just that it wasn't mentioned. Um, okay. You know, I'll state that we had this pretty substantial study looking at herbicide use and forest plantations at least. And you know, those, um, the immediate effect on the vegetation is really obvious. And so, but throughout that early stage, we did see a lot of recolonization by a variety of different songbird species as the shrubs spilled back in. So, you know, herbicides are used to manage vegetation to get trees to grow as rapidly as, as possible. You know, economically speaking, that's, um, you know, benefit to the return on investment. And um, we did a study to look at the trade-offs. And so it does kind of depend on what species you're interested in. And, uh, but when it comes to songbird diversity, at least, you know, just as some of those shrubs start to fill in, you do see a lot more songbirds filling in. Um, the forage for deer and elk does come back, but it does have an initial negative effect on um, certain species initially. So I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Fran. I do. Um, so an example of how my family has used herbicide, um, we have a piece of property out Penn Road um, west of Eugene and it, um, about, I want to say seven acres, but maybe it's a little more than that, is underneath power line, Bonneville Power right away. And it was completely overgrown with uh, squash broom which is a terrible invasive species. And so we worked with Bonneville Power, closely supervised by my parents, and herbicide was used to control the non-native um, scotch broom. And in this situation, I don't think we could have done it in any other way. And then my parents um, maintain that also through herbicide. And what we have now is a um, shrub, uh, native shrub and um, for patch that is a songbird mecca. So it's super exciting. So herbicides can be a tool used for controlling invasive species. Um, I work with the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District and they use them there for control of invasive species. There are plenty of people that don't want to use herbicides and there are ways to control invasives without using herbicides as well. Um, so now we've talked about herbicides in this presentation. <laughs> So yeah, I think they might have been asking about boomer clipping and herbicide use now, but um, I don't know if there's a whole lot of research that's that's come out on the relationships between uh, mountain beavers and herbicides. So oh, yeah. well, I've just done a little bit of a literature review on mountain beavers for another project, and I didn't, I wasn't looking specifically for that, but I didn't find anything specific to mountain beavers and herbicides. Yeah. Maybe they're wondering about vegetation availability. Yeah, that's a, yeah. I would have to think about that a little bit more. Yeah, I think Jimmy Taylor with, with APHIS might've done a small project previously. Um, yeah. 
So going back to the invasives question and herbicides, um, someone asked about blackberries and your thoughts on blackberries. And there's a small patch of woods behind their house that's been completely taken over by blackberries. Do they provide good habitat? Should they order a large herd of goats or <laughs> learn to live with them? Yeah. Definitely get the goats because who does not want to have goats come visit your property? Uh, that's a thing now. You can hire a goat herder and their goats to come take care of your blackberry. Um, I love this question. I've gotten this question before on Blackberry and let, you know, and we actually have, so Thomas is a wildlife biologist also. So I think you get multi varying opinions depending on who you ask. And so Himalaya Blackberry is an invasive species. However, I love Blackberry pie and I love Blackberry jam. Um, it can provide cover and food for wildlife. And so what I would say about it is um, it sort of depends on your objectives. And um, also to have a plan. So if you rip out the blackberry, um, you need to have a plan for what's going back in, because otherwise you're going to get blackberry there again, or you might get something worse like scotch broom. And so to just think about that. Um, if you do decide to live with it, then I would caution that you won't want it to take over, take over, take over. But a small patch can be nice for you know family use of blackberries. Yeah, and the, yeah. the rediscovery forest, we managed it uh, in the young stands so it wouldn't dominate and not let the seedlings grow. But in our middle age where it's more shaded out, we have let some small patches occur there. Um, so again, like you said, just objectives and depending on um, you knowing control and how much it could take over an area because it can be pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very aggressive and it's yeah, really, really difficult to mechanically get rid of it, is what yeah. I've heard, because of, they spread underground, they produce the fruits, and they do this weird, weird crawling thing where um, they kind of fall over and then sprout up and then fall over. So. Thomas, do you want to make sure we launch the poll and uh, let people oh, know? Yeah, so we'll go ahead and um, launch a poll and, you know, y'all can stick around. We have got some more questions um that, that are coming in and so this is just kind of um just for for our for our sake if you can answer some of these questions it'll help us in the future but uh, we still got some questions so i'm going to leave that poll open feel free to uh, go ahead and enter in your answers to those poll questions and i'll continue with some of these questions um, one person asked, will the wolf populations eventually spread to most of Oregon's forests? If so, is this a good thing? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, I'm so glad that, that we brought up wolves. Um, <laughs> they're probably in more places than we think. Um, and I, I do work with a lot of folks that have some wolf fear. Um, personally, I would always be more cautious around a mountain lion than a wolf. Um, I feel like there's more danger living and working in the woods from mountain lions than there are from wolves. Um, I do have a couple of wildlife management plans for um, my clients that are in wolf territories. And in terms of forestry, they're extremely easy to manage around. Um, what we're doing is we're protecting known den sites. We're keeping an eye out for if we see wolf activity. Uh, if we see wolf activity, we report it to our Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so, you know, it would just be something new, right? It, uh, something new for us to deal with on the west side here. But I, I do think eventually, and it's highly controversial whether that's good or bad. And if you're a rancher, you might have some other thoughts on it and those are certainly valid. Yeah, and it'll certainly be interesting given the cougar population that we have in Western Oregon and sort of, uh, you know, they're finding in, in certain areas. I think um, there's just a study in, I can't remember if it was Yellowstone, but basically in areas where there's wolves now, the cougars are kind of moving out. Um, so yeah, and then the dense terrain of like the coast range, I can't imagine these rainforest wolves <laughs> running around. Uh, but, you know, I've had foresters basically be like yeah we can't wait for wolves to come because then the deer won't be eating our trees you know sort of thing but then you got the ranchers and 
you know, maybe the small um, landowners that might have livestock that would be, that would be concerned. So it's, it's a complex issue. It's certainly a complex. There's something fun though to do for everybody can do this on their own. Uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has a wolf ID quiz that you can take. And so to learn the difference between a coyote and a wolf, and you might be thinking, I know the difference. And I think that I do too, but the quiz is really fun and will just test your skill at identifying the two. And um, I did not get a hundred percent. I got close, but I did get a couple wrong. So um, I encourage everyone to take that quiz. You can just Google it, it comes right up. They should have like a cougar versus a house cat quiz too. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Or versus a bobcat, I get people or get versus that. Versus a bobcat, yeah, I've get I've gotten that one. Um, Look for the tail. Look for the tail. So um, somebody asked if the priority species guide is available online to download, and it is. Um, Absolutely, yes. And then we um, we also in the resource section. If they go to the resource section, we have it already downloaded into that box. And then if they also, we put a link in the resource section that goes right to OregonForest.org. And you can go to our publications and any of the OFRI publications mentioned today, you can either download them or order them for free and we'll mail those out within a few weeks. Um, so those are all available. Yeah, and, and speaking of resources, there's a couple more questions about resources. Um, one, is there a similar online tool for species in Washington state? I'm not so familiar with Washington, but I believe they do have one. Yeah, so for Washington, it's a little more complicated. Um, I think I actually, oh, if, about the IPAC. I've never tried to use the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for Washington, but I, so I don't know the answer to that. I, I would have to look and see. Um, in terms of priority species, though, for Washington, so the OFRI guide is just for Oregon. Um, they do have a similar program in Washington. It's their priority species and habitats. And so you can, um, it's through Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and they have, um, you can talk to, um, you can request the data on a site-by-site -site, um, basis there and it's not expensive to do so. It's not free, but it's not expensive. Great. Um, and so regarding resources, is there a current state of knowledge publication for Northern Spotted Owl specific to the Pacific Northwest? So there's a ginormous body of research on the Northern Spotted Owl specific to the Pacific Northwest. The OFRI publication on the North Spotted Owl is, is old and um, has we have not updated that yet. Um, and in fact, if those of you paying attention to um, information on the Spotted Owl, the its listing status was just, um, just that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided that it's warranted to um, uplist it to endangered from threatened, however precluded um, based on higher priority species. So I'm not sure when that change is gonna happen from threatened to endangered, but that's definitely coming. Um, I'm not sure yet what that's gonna mean for management, if anything, they're already protected. Yeah, so, um, you know, I would, I would suggest someone even mentioned um, U.S. Forest Service, I would suggest um, Fish and Wildlife, you know, looking at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife for a lot of their information. Yeah, they have a page dedicated to the Spotted Owl and it has all the updated um, yeah. information on it. It can be pretty dense, but... And we have a fact sheet. We do, uh, OFRI, has, we have, through our program, we have a fact sheet as well on the Spotted Owl, which will walk you through what's required under the forest practice rules. Yeah, good answer. Yeah, because there, it, yes, Forest Practices Act is important. Uh, <laughs> thoughts on bear and timber conflict? Oh, well, that's a very broad question. I have lots of thoughts about bear and timber conflict. Um, first of all, let me say that I love bears. And um, if you Google um, or go to Ofri's blog, I wrote a blog on, on bears. I went out with Vanessa Petro to look, uh, she's studying bear damage and uh, she invited me to go in the woods with her to look, to find a, a mama bear and her cub in, in the den. And 
I went and I thought, this is going to be great. And I got out there and it occurred to me, this is a personal information, but I wear apricot scented deodorant. And I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? I am going in to, I'm looking for a bear smelling like food. Awesome. Like, you know, it was, and I, I mean, I love bears. And so, you know, we're sneaking through the woods and we did find mama bear and her cub, but she was not interested in me. She got the heck out of there. Um, they have multiple den sites. So um, we just quickly took measurements on the den and got out of there. So we are, if we can find out, and Jimmy Taylor and Vanessa are working on this, if we can find out what, you know, so some bears peel trees, right? That's the, that's the problem. Not all bears peel trees. And there's a lot of speculation on what that trigger is. What's the nutrition they're looking in? Is it something in the soil? Is it something in the bark? What, what is it that makes them do this? Uh, so we need to know that so that we can manage for it because when you get a, a bear peeler, it can be a big problem, but they don't all do it. So it's kind of hit and miss. Right, yeah, and in some areas, you know, you might not see any bear damage in other areas you might have very you know substantial areas and it's typically they're going to be doing it in the early spring right as soon as they come out of hibernation or yeah. sorry torpor as soon as they come out of their torpor their deep sleep it's not technically hibernation it's not, but they're really hungry right and right. sugars in the in in the inner bark is really what they're looking for yep and um yeah and in the past they had done a lot of surveys and thought there was a extensive damage everywhere and i think come to find out it was root rot pockets in some cases so you know you really kind of got to look for the the individual sign of bear peeling <clears throat> and you'll find these you know strips of bark um you can oftentimes see the claw marks and they'll differ uh from port say porcupine damage and that it, you'll see the claw marks and more of the sharp like teeth versus the porcupine you'll just see those incisor marks on them the that's bark. right yeah but yeah can be a problem probably not always and yeah it's funny uh, vanessa was even saying maybe it's a learned behavior as well right right it could be learned as well so it's like oh please don't teach your young to do that because then obviously we gotta take care of that problem <laughs> So doesn't look like we have anything else coming in. I'm going to put up this last slide, just advertise your east side. Oh, yeah. Please, please put a plug in for that. I guess I'll, I can go ahead and talk about that if you don't mind. Please. Uh, so we had we had this um, Forest of Eastern Oregon webinar series we put on this last fall that was focused more on um, the ecology of east side forest. And this winter, starting on January 14th at 6 p.m., we're uh, starting our new series called Managing Eastern Oregon Forests. And it kind of goes into um, the principles and sort of practices involving management for a wide variety of, of resources uh, and objectives, including wildlife habitat, timber production, forest health, fire resilience. So please stay tuned if you're interested in learning more about the forest ecology of the east side. There's my plug. Perfect. And we have one other uh, plug to, uh, you know, there's a lot of great resources out there for wildlife and I just highlight a few of them today. And we also, um, you know, again, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has some great things about their, uh, you know, some of the programs they offer. And if you want also assistance for promoting wildlife, there may also be some grants available. We didn't, you know, cover that today. And then just also another reminder from uh, an audience member about the Oregon Biodiversity Map viewer, which is also another great tool. So a lot of really good tools out there. You know, this was just a snapshot today of some of those tools and how we've used them to develop plans and, and help you know, people think about enhancing wildlife on their property. And so just, um, again, Fran and I are open to, if people have more questions as they come along, get in touch with us and let us know if you have other questions or if you're looking for certain, um, you know, tools that we certainly help get you out any of those resources we can help find. Thank you. Thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to the speakers um, and all the attendees for all the great questions. There was a lot of really complex but questions, but really insightful. You know, it's unfortunate with, you know, wildlife ecology, a lot of it's a, uh, well, it, it depends, you know. And so we appreciate those questions and hope that we're able to answer them as best as possible. And yeah, again, thank you again for 
to the um, presenters, Julie and Fran. Absolutely. Thanks for having us today. We appreciate it and look forward to continuing the conversations. Thank right. you. It's fun to be here. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.